light shine among us, His glory revealed. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified. Glorious day. One day they led him to Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Hill nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming. Glorious day, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled. Rose over death, he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death cannot hold him, the grave cannot keep him from rising again. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried. My sins far away, rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Brookhaven. It has been a bit of a, a morning of distractions for us that are involved in preparing for the service. As Horatio mentioned, there was some work being done and electrical circuits that had to be uh, disconnected. And so when we came in this morning, everything powered up fine, no sound through the speakers. And come to find out the circuit that was disabled was the one that goes to the amplifiers that, that power the room. And so we got that solved and then found out right before service that we have no front projectors. So thank you for bearing with us. And um, 
Sometimes Satan does things like that to get in the way and get us distracted, but God is God, and we will worship him no matter what. So thank you for doing that with us. And uh, I want to take a moment to welcome our guest speaker this morning from the Georgia Baptist Convention. He's going to present a message this morning on, mich on missions. Please welcome Stuart Lang. Thank you. It is a, uh, it's a joy for me to be here today. I have gotten to know your pastor a little bit. We have spent more time emailing each other and then got to meet each other a couple of weeks ago via e uh, over lunch. And I'm just excited about what the Lord is doing here at Brookhaven and uh, getting to meet Brother Don. He is a fireball, isn't he? <laughs> Am I going to get in trouble for saying, is that okay? He is just a great guy. And uh, just have fallen in love with him. Here's, uh, and I don't know how much he's told you. We're going to be in Acts 1. I'll let you be turning there while I do this. Uh, when, I, when I first got introduced to uh, Brother Don in January, he sent me an email saying, we need some help at Brookhaven. Can you get a team to come help us do some things, uh, renovation here at the church and that kind of thing? Because that's part of what I do as your state missionary. I help mobilize volunteers and so when there's a need like that I put it out I try to get people interested to come and put him in touch put those teams in touch with brother Don and honestly it was a little while after that before I heard from him again so I don't know how all of that fit together but long about uh, April or May brother Don sent me another email and he said Brother Stewart, I want you to know that uh, we're gearing up for our basketball camp that we get to have every year. And uh, I think you partner with Paducah, Kentucky, and, and it's just been a great partnership there. And, and he was so excited about what was going. But then the next email was, we want to go on a mission trip. Do you have somewhere where we can go? And I was so thrilled to hear this. I, I, I don't want to diminish the need for people to come here at all, but within your pastor's heart, I noticed this change from, can you send somebody to us, to now he was asking, can you give us a place where we can go? And then uh, we got him in touch with a couple of options and possibilities there, and I believe some of you went to Maxie's, Georgia. Did you even know there was a Maxie's, Georgia? I don't, I don't know that I knew of a place called Maxie's more than six months ago. A little wide spot in the road, but you know, there's a little Hispanic church going into a building there, and that building needed a lot of repair. And, and some of you went and helped there in Maxie's, Georgia. And then uh, last month, or two months ago now, I guess in July, you went downtown Atlanta and you did some, uh, worked in a, was it a soup kitchen or you fed the hungry or something, but you took on a ministry project. And here was the email I got from Brother Don. Uh, he told me the number of people that participated in that project, and this is what he said, over 50% of our congregation was involved in that one-day ministry project. And I just about did a backflip in my chair at, at the office when I read that. that was, that's just exciting. That is tremendous. And so I want to say to you, Brookhaven Baptist Church, thank God for you. Praise the Lord for what He's doing here in your congregation and your community. May your tribe increase. And uh, if there's anything I can do along the way to help you, that's what I want to do. I, I am your state missionary. I got over titles a long time ago. I'm old enough to where I don't care about titles. Uh, people ask me what my title is. I'm a state missionary. Let's just leave it there, okay? I'm responsible for disaster relief and mission mobilization. And uh, those are two pretty broad hats. But the mission mobilization, I think, is where it's going to hit and maybe impact you at Brookhaven, and that means my job is to help you get where the Lord wants you to be. My job is to help you make those missional connections. My job is to help encourage and equip you to be strategically missional. And those might be a, that might be a new word for you, the word missional. I don't know. It's a good word. And it really, uh, it encompasses, it's a, it's a broad, encompassing thing. And this is what I want to share with you this morning from Acts chapter 1. I want to encourage you to be a missional church. Now, if I say missionary or mission-minded, well, that can mean different things for different churches. Uh, I've pastored mission-minded churches in that they gave financially to support missions. And that's one part of it. That's great. I remember growing up, my dad was a pastor, and so we had a strong 
WMU. Anybody know I'm remember hands? Do I have hands for WMU? Brotherhood, RAs, GAs, ACT teens, all of that. I grew up in some churches where we had those missions education going on from child all the way up through adults. And every year we had a Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And at Christmas we had Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And both of those offerings were for missions, either international or North American missions. And that's part of the strategy. I remember every year between or before those mission offerings took place, we had a, a prayer a week of prayer for international missions or North American missions. And there was a whole emphasis given, and it seemed like it lasted a month or more, but that we were praying specifically for missionaries in the international field, praying for missionaries in what we used to call a home mission board. And then we would give an offering for that. Right now we're in September. And the month of September is devoted to Mission Georgia. And so we're in a season of prayer right now for missions right here in Georgia. And there is a special offering, the Mission Georgia offering that you can participate in. And all of that goes to missions right here in Georgia. Now, does that sound a little odd to some of you that we would have a missions emphasis in the state of Georgia? When I was growing up, my dad was a pastor. I loved it when a real live missionary came to our church. If a real live missionary came and preached in dad's pulpit, that means they sat at mom's table. <laughs> my mom was just a great cook. And so if I had a real live missionary come to my house, that means I got to bug the stew out of them over lunchtime. And I would ask all sorts of ridiculous questions. But I loved that. I loved entertaining real live missionaries. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe a real dead missionary would show up sometime. I don't know. But in my mind, I thought to be a real life missionary, you have to be from a country overseas. It's not real life missions work unless it's overseas somewhere. And you know, that's, that's, that's incomplete. That's not a holistic picture here. So let me, let me share some, uh, just two or three. I don't want to bore you with numbers, but let me share two or three statistics with you about Georgia. Our state is increasingly lost and unchurched. Our state is 70 to 80 percent lost and unchurched. So much for a Bible belt. When I was growing up in Athens, Georgia, we prided ourselves as Southern Baptists in, in this part of the country that we were part of the Bible belt in Georgia. Well, goodness, we just know this is the best state ever. And so Georgia must be the belt buckle of the Bible belt. But not if 70% of our state is lost and 80% unchurched. I, I, that doesn't compute. That doesn't, that doesn't add up. Right now we're inside the perimeter. Inside the perimeter of 285, that percentage goes on up to about 95% lost and unchurched. I got here early. Uh, you just never know. I live north of Atlanta, and so I never know what traffic's going to do. I never know what weather's going to do, and there's a lot of depressed UGA fans after yesterday's ball game, so I didn't know if that was going to impact my drive coming into the perimeter or not. And so I left early. When I got here, I, I just drove, I, just one block, but I drove around your, your mission field you got a beautiful neighborhood, your community right here. But you got a ton of houses here. You, there's no telling how many people live within a quarter mile of this church. Now, I don't know what that number is. I really don't. Let, let me throw out a conservative number and say there's a thousand people that live within a quarter mile of this church. I think that's way low. But if there's a thousand people that live within a quarter mile of Brookhaven Baptist Church, that means 700 to 800 of them, at least 7 to 800 of them, are not in church anywhere right now. Well, where, where has God put you? He's, he's put you right here. In the middle of that mission field, you're in this zip code, and you're God's missionary right here in this community. Now, that's the, that, I know you're not supposed to give your punchline until the end of the sermon, but that was it. I'll give it to you ahead of time, okay? 
You are God's missionary right here in this community. Can I go a step further? There ain't nobody else. You're it. You're it. Brookhaven Baptist Church. You're it. Tag. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> Now, you have help. I don't want you to feel like you're thrown out there to the wolves and you're all by yourself. But you, you and where I live, I have to take responsibility for the fact I'm it. And God's putting me on Susie Lane. And, and where I live, I'm the missionary in my community. And, and by the grace of God, I've got to start making inroads into my community to let them know I am a man of faith. We are a family of faith. God is real. He's not dead. Movie, yes, have you seen it? God's not dead. He's still alive. He's still on the throne, and he wants to love you and make a difference in your life. I'm it for Susie Lane. You're it for Brookhaven Community. So that's what we're going to look at today. Acts chapter 1. Are you there? Have you had time to find it yet? I am old-fashioned, and uh, I just believe in honoring the Word of God. Would you stand one more time? While I read these few verses, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth." Lord, I pray you'd help us today to take a fresh look at a very familiar passage. I pray you'd help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear how this may apply to us. And I also want to thank you for Brookhaven Baptist Church and for what you're doing here in this congregation. Thank you for her pastor. I pray your blessing, your wisdom, your, your direction in his life as he leads this church to be a missional church for your honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I got, um, I got three main points that I want to share with you. And then I want to, point number four is going to be some practical, practical application. Uh, I've been a pastor for 16 years. I've been at uh, a state missionary for almost eight years. And when I was pastoring, I knew that I needed to be a Great Commission believer. I knew that I needed to pastor a church that was going to obey the Great Commission. <laughs> the problem was nobody ever told me how. <laughs> and so I, the older I get, the more practical I want to be. And so point number four is going to be just some, some handles on how to be missional, okay? Let's look at three peas in a pod. My first three points, three peas in a pod. Number one is the promise. And we see the promise of Jesus in verses four and five. Here's how it goes. Wait here. I want you to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. Don't leave. Stay here and wait for the promise of God the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to understand that my theology is pretty secure here. I, I believe that the moment you give your life to Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. Y'all okay? Amen? The moment you are saved, the moment you say yes to Jesus, the very same moment that you invite Jesus into your life and you give your life to Him, you get all of God the Holy Spirit in you at the same moment. He never leaves and He's never gone. You, you cannot lose the Holy Spirit. He has you. He keeps you. He is God's seal of redemption on your life. He is the earnest of God on your life until the day God takes you home, either through death or the rapture. And I'm praying for the latter to come. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Now, I know that when you give your life to Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. But here's the point that I want us to share. I want to think on for just a second. I'm afraid that in too many of our churches, in too many of our lives, and I'll point the finger back to me, we have lost the discipline of waiting on God. I hate 
to wait. I hate to wait. I am not a patient waiter. I do not understand why if Walmart has 36 lanes, they only have three open. My philosophy of driving is get over or park. I like the left lane. If you're not going to go the speed limit, plus a little bit, get over. I don't like to wait. I, I'm terrible at it. But that's not the biblical perspective of waiting. Here's what the Bible means when we see the word wait. Henry Blackaby summarized it very well in Experiencing God when he said, to wait on God means you keep doing the last thing he told you to do. What was the last thing God told you to do? Well, there are some general things like read your Bible and pray and give and go to church and share your faith. And those are common to all of us. There may be some specific things that God told you to do. And, and while you're waiting on God, well, you keep doing the last thing God told you to do. But while, you're, while you are obedient doing the last thing God told you to do, you are also earnestly seeking His face, seeking His will in your life and the life of your family and the life of your church. You, you're continuously striving after the knowledge of God and His perfect will for your life. That is waiting on God. So where's the application for the church? I think as a church, we need to build into our calendar, we need to build into our worship services intentional times of getting on our face before God in golden silence. We don't, we don't plan a bunch of stuff. We just plan to get alone with God and seek His face. We lay our agendas aside. We leave our personal preferences outside. We come together and we get on our face before God and say, Oh Lord, oh Lord God, what would you do? What would you have us do for your honor and glory at Brookhaven Baptist Church? I remember in South Carolina, my first church out of seminary, I was minister of music and education. And I visited another church in our association for an annual fall associational meeting. And when I got there, it was a little white frame church out in the country. And I remember hearing some of the men talk in that church about the days gone by, several decades ago. Laying by time. Any of y'all know what laying by time is? Are any of you old enough to remember what laying by time is in August? It usually comes around in August. It's when you get the crops in. It's when you, you've harvested everything and you've got a period of time. It's, a, it's not real long, but you've got a short, a, a short period of downtime before you really kick into the next phase of harvesting and getting ready, getting ground ready for the crops and everything. And so that's when the church has always had revival. It was in laying by time. And I remember the, the men of that church telling me that they remember as young men coming to the church the week before revival services. Now the ladies could come if they wanted to, but the ladies went inside the church. The men of the church would go around back and down into the woods and they would get on their knees on, in those woods and they would each grab hold of a sapling, a, a small young tree. They'd grab hold of a sapling and they'd pray for hours into the evening and into the night, sometimes into the early hours of the morning and they would, they would thank God for that harvest and they would thank God for His blessing and His provision. But then they would grab hold that sapling and they would cry out to God for God to bring a revival, for God to bring spiritual renewal, for God to save souls, for God to do something that only God could do. That's what it means to wait on God. And I don't see that happening much in my life or in the lives of our churches much anymore. Do you want the promise of God do you want to see the empowering promise of God's Holy Spirit take place and take root in your church? Do you want to see God move in a mighty, mighty way? Can I tell you something? So does God. And it won't happen until we wait on Him. Number two, the second P. Y'all 
Y'all going to have to listen a little bit faster, okay, or I'm not going to get through. Brother Don told me I could go to about 1.30 and y'all would be okay with that. But still, the number two is the purpose. I want to try to move through this real quick. Uh, verses 6 and 7, I want you to imagine with me for just a second that Peter, don't you love Peter? It, it doesn't say this. I'm reading between the lines, and since I'm the one preaching the sermon, y'all can take my, my story and go with it, okay? Can't you just imagine Peter coming up to Jesus in verse 6 and saying, hey, I think this would be a really good time for you to overthrow Rome, overthrow the Sanhedrin, set up your earthly kingdom. We'll be your cabinet. I'll be your secretary of state. Uh, James and John, one can be your vice president. That's okay. And one can be the secretary of defense. And we can just, we can handle this thing. And, and we'll, we, this is, I mean, you've done some pretty cool things, Jesus. Feeding 5,000, feeding 4,000, walking on the water, Raising the dead. But this latest trick, this latest trick, when you died on the cross and you actually died and then you came back to life. It wasn't you raising somebody else. You came back to life. Lord, that was, that was the kicker. And I just think this would be a really good time to capitalize on all of that and set up your earthly kingdom. And Jesus says in verse 7, Peter, it's none of your business. Peter, you're not even asking the right question. Peter, you are, you're trying to think in temporal, earthly things, and my father's thinking in heavenly, eternal things, and you're not even on the right page. So here's how it works out for me. Stuart comes. Lord, we're in a mess. It sure would be a good time for you to come back. We're at war. Terrorism is rising. You fill in the blank. It sure would be a good time for you to come back. And Jesus says the same thing to me that he said to Peter. Stuart, don't worry about what you can't change. Here's what I want you to do in your life. Here's my purpose for your life. It's actually found in verse 8. I want you to be my martyr. Now, all of you with your Bibles open... And all of you who heard me read verse 8 will automatically in your mind, if you're still with me, say, no, 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 no. That's not what it says. It says, you shall be my witnesses. Well, in the English, yes, that's what it says. But the Greek word for witnesses is the word martyr. So how about this? I know you came to church, you wanted to feel good today. <laughs> and brother, it, sometimes it just happens. Stuff just happens and it doesn't always work out. But I know that all of you, you came and you, you wanted to hear a good sermon. You wanted to feel good and you just want to be encouraged in your faith and leave feeling on cloud nine. That's why we come to church is one reason anyway. How about this? Instead of telling you that I want you to come to church so that you can find life and get abundant and full and joy and exciting and all that. I want you to come to church so you can figure out how to die. I think that's the message we need to be sharing. Well, Stuart, that just doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my martyrs. I want you to die to yourself so that you can live for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to die to your personal preferences and agendas so that you can have a kingdom mindset. I want you to die to your personal comfort so that you will be willing to give up whatever you need to give up to share the gospel, the faith, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ with people who need it. I want you to die to your own personal whim so that you can live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. I want you to die. Paul had it right. In Galatians 2.20, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. What's God's purpose for your life? He wants you to die to yourself so that you can be a martyr for him. Number three. He has a plan. He doesn't just tell us this and then leave us uh, wondering, well, how do we do this? He gives us a plan. I want you to be my martyr, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
And most every time that you hear this verse preached, you're going to hear something like this. Jerusalem is your church, Brookhaven Baptist Church, working with your association to reach your community for Christ. Judea, Brookhaven Baptist Church, working with the Georgia Baptist Convention to reach our state for Christ. Samaria, Brookhaven Baptist Church. Are you starting to get the theme here? You're engaged at every circle. Brookhaven Baptist Church, working with the North American Mission Board to reach our country, our, our continent, North America, for Christ. The ends of the earth. Brookhaven Baptist Church, working with the International Mission Board to reach our world for Christ. And there's not a thing wrong with that, except that I think Jesus had a cultural idea in mind when he gave us the words that we know as Acts 1-8. So let me redefine it. Jerusalem. As people who are like you, and they are accessible. They look like you, they talk like you, they shop in the same places that you shop. They work in the same place. They go to school in the same place. You have similar desires and affinities. They look like you, and they're accessible. Judea. That's people who are like you, but they're not quite as accessible. Right now, my heart is grieving for that international field of Columbia, South Carolina, because there's just got to be a big need for the gospel there after last night. I'm just thinking... There might be some people who are like me in Columbia, South Carolina, but we need to get there and reach them. I'm just hurting for Mark Rick right now. Can you tell my pains? My, I'm praying the Lord to bless there. So I, I can go to Columbia, South Carolina. It's not accessible. It's not easy. It's not close, but I can get there. And when I get there, I'm going to find people who are like me. The rub comes with Samaria. And if you'll notice, I'm bringing my circle back in. Samaria are people who are not like you, but they are accessible. Different culture, different religion, different language, different affinity, different preferences, different desires, different, different style of living. But they may live across the street from you. They are accessible. Where Jesus was standing, he was closer to Samaria than he was the southern part of Judea. And Jesus died for those who are culturally different from you, just like he died for you. Y'all are pretty quiet. Can I give you another chance to say amen right there? Jesus died for those who are culturally different from you, just like he died for you and me. Amen? Our Samaria doesn't have to be in another state or even in another city. It might be across the street, our backdoor neighbor. It might be somebody who works in the next cubicle or sits in the next desk. That's our Samaria. And we need to be willing to die to ourselves so that we can tell them about the living Savior. That's the plan. That's the plan. We need to be developing eyes for people who are like us who need Jesus and for people who are not like us who need Jesus. The commonality is they need Jesus. And we have the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ to unlock and unfold for them. So lastly, number four, let me give you some handles on how to be a missional church. I'm going to give you four quick, four quick. This is another pod of four Ps, okay? Projects like Operation Christmas Child. Project like backpacks for Appalachia that the Georgia Baptist Convention is doing. We're going to collect them this fall and send them to children in Appalachia. We've had international missionaries come to parts of Appalachia and tell us this. They thought they had seen poverty in third world countries, but they had not seen anything like it until they got 
to some of the places in Appalachia. That's a project. I'm state director for disaster relief. Disaster relief is a very special kind of project where when a tornado or a flood hits a community, we go in and help the people for free. We, we get the trees off their house. We feed them. We take care of their children. We, we just minister to their needs, and in the process, we share our faith with them. That is a special type of project. Can I tell you that ministry is the key to meet, to reaching people for the kingdom of Jesus? It, when you go in, not just your church, in any church in our Georgia Baptist Convention right now, it is obvious that people are not knocking down the doors to get into our churches. Church, we've got to go beyond the four walls of the church if we're ever going to have a hope of reaching our community for the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with ministry, projects. Find a need, meet the need, share your faith. Number two, pee in the pot here. Mission trips and partnerships. I would love to help your church find another state, another church, another people group, another country, another something that you can adopt. You may find it through Backpacks for Appalachia. There are ministry sites all up and down in Appalachia that you can adopt as a church. And you take mission trips there. You, you, you keep going to the same place for three years, five years at a time. Maybe, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Maybe you get up to five times a year. You take a small, you, don't, you usually don't take a large group, but you take a small group. And you keep going back and you build a relationship. Mission trips. My job is to help you find that place and make that point of connection. The number three is Personnel. I want to challenge you with this one especially. Brookhaven Baptist Church, would you be willing to pray about adopting either a missionary or a church planner? It may be an international missionary, a North American missionary. It may be a church planner. It might be a church planner right here in greater metro Atlanta. We have a mammoth church planning effort going on. We're trying to plant 667 churches in the 16-county metro area of Atlanta by the year 2020. That's going to be a God-sized task. Okay, Stuart, uh, we're sort of a small church. How in the world do you expect us to adopt a church planner? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you how simple it is. You ready? You find out who the church planner is. If you need help, start with me. Start with me. Let me just make it as simple as I can. Let me be your first point of contact. I don't have all the answers, but I'll find somebody who does. But for the sake of you, contact me. Your pastor has my email. Contact me, and I will find somebody for you. How do you adopt a church planner? You get that person. And then when you have prayer meeting, you circle up, and you say, we're going to pray for church planner and for church planner's wife and for the church planner's children. And you call their names out in prayer to the Lord. You do that every week. Every week when you get together in prayer meeting, you call that church planner out in prayer to the Lord. And then about once a month or so, get you a blank card. Blank, that means nothing on it. Blank card. And on one side, you, put the, you, you address it to that church planner and put a stamp on there. On the back side of that card, put one sentence up at the top. Dear brother and sisters, however you want to address it, we prayed for you in our weekly prayer meeting this week. And every one of you that's present, sign it. Drop it in the mail, and that will bless his socks off. Now, you keep doing that for a month, two months, three months. You keep praying for that person week after week after week and month after month, and somebody's going to step up on a prayer meeting Wednesday night and say, Hey, don't they have babies? And somebody goes, yeah, I think so. I think they got two little children. Well, why don't we take up just a little love offering and send them a gift card so that they can buy some diapers and formula? And the rest of you say, well, what's spiritual about that? Ask the church planner. And you just strengthen your partnership, your adoption of that person, personnel, of that person and his family. You can do that. You can do that. And then another couple of months are going to go by and that church planner is going to come across a need. It may be something like this. We have access to a community center, but there's graffiti all over it and, and the weeds are grown up. Would you be, Brookhaven, would you be willing to come and help us paint and clean up and cut some grass? And you say, sure, we can do that. 
Brother Don is after me right now. He wants a mission project for October. That might be it. I don't know. But you go and you help. And when people come by the community center and say, why are you doing this? They say, because we're in partnership with this church planner, and he's trying to start a church because he loves you, and so does Jesus. And if you have faith questions, that's where you need to go. That's how easy it is to adopt a church planner. You can do that. The last one is to adopt a people group. And that's the hardest. I save it for last because it's the hardest. You'd be hard pressed. Most all of our churches by themselves would be hard pressed to adopt a people group. And time doesn't allow me to really get into that. But I, what if you start praying about it? You can at least pray for a people group and you may be able to Work, how about, how about this for a novel idea of Southern Baptist? Work cooperatively with some other churches to adopt that people group. Reach them for the Lord. Wow. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my martyrs. So here's my closing statement, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to have an invitation. If you tell me that you've been saved by the grace of God, but you've been sitting on the pews for all of your saved life, I'm going to say there's something wrong with your faith. Because if you've been saved, you've received the Holy Spirit. And according to Acts 1.8, if you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall be His martyrs. It is unconscionable in God's economy that we would claim to be saved by the grace of God and not serve in the grace of God. Dear Jesus, I pray that you would bless Brookhaven Baptist Church, bless her pastor. Lord, there may be somebody present today who needs to give his or her life to you. I, I pray, Lord, that there would be something sung or spoken or prayed or done that would just help them to see their need for you. And Lord, there is no doubt believers here who have said yes to you a long time ago, but maybe they're the ones sitting on the pew that now need to say, I need to engage my faith to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough to sit at home in my prayer closet and read my Bible. I need to be sharing that faith with somebody who needs you. Lord, I pray that today they would obey you and just say, Lord, as Isaiah did, here am I, Lord, send me. Who do I need to tell about your wondrous love? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand? I'll be here to receive you. If you have any questions, prayer, you come to me, please, okay? When we walk with